Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the uh, special session number 42, jointly organized by the Regional Science Association and the ESOP. Uh, this afternoon, we will be discussing about the role of new technology in planning addresses, addressing global challenges. This session is organized um, by, is chaired by uh, myself and uh, Paolo Silva uh, within the activity of the um, thematic group, ISOP thematic group of new technology and planning. And if you don't want to, if you don't, are not, if you don't know the thematic group, our work, uh, um, there is a paper, I will paste it in the chat later, a paper Paolo and I wrote a few years ago that uh, in a way summarized the activities of this working group. And uh, uh, I would like um, to thank also um, ISOP for supporting this uh, meeting. The main issue we are discussing this afternoon is how new technology may innovate future spatial planning research and practice in a time when new global and local urgent challenges are affecting with unprecedented magnitude human development and the environment. Basically, we, be, we will be discussing both the role of the technology in supporting the process, and this is possibly the main focus, but uh, also uh, how technology uh, can be introduced uh, into the design to improve the design. And uh, the program of this afternoon, uh, of, of the session, uh, I will give um, uh, the floor to Paolo. Um, uh, in, a, in a while, uh, also, uh, ISOP uh, Secretary General Angelique uh, Ketiparam Keti uh, is with us today to um, welcome uh, all of you. And then we will have the main speaker. We have, I'm very glad today because we have four outstanding speaker, uh, colleagues uh, well known internationally and have been working for decades uh, in, this, in this field with uh, excellent results. Uh, and I will introduce them um, after uh, the introduction. And at the end, uh, I hope we will have uh, some, some time for answering questions. In the meantime, please um, ask questions through the chat and, um, and we can have a, a short discussion at the end. So, Paolo. My turn to welcome everyone and to congratulate uh, uh, also, Michele, for being here with him, it's a great joy and pleasure to to be part of this of, of this event. We've been uh, co or co coordinating in a very good teamwork for the last since 2016. This this thematic group in different in different uh, arrangements. Now we we started this year a new arrangement in in which Michele takes uh, the coordination uh, parts of it. In the past years, apart from the publication that uh, Michele already uh, um, um, referred, we also have been quite well present in, in the ESOP conferences, not only chairing the, the track sessions on this uh, subject, on new technologies and planning, but also organizing thematic meetings and, and, and so on. So uh, to, this was an opportunity this year to, to, to organize and to structure our activity in a different way. And so I hope that we will have a very great and fruitful uh, session with our wonderful speakers that we all know very well, but I will pass now the, the, the word to, I guess, Angelique for uh, the sec our Secretary General of, of ESOP, Angelique Chetiparam. Thank you, Paolo, um, and a very warm welcome to everybody. I just wanted to give you a bit of a background to how we came about uh, today. Um, so the background to the session. Um, as you know, the session is a result of two associations, the Regional Studies Association and ESOP working together. So how this came about is during the pandemic, uh, we of course had to necessarily cancel face-to-face -face sessions. Um, and uh, we were striving to find ways of maintaining a sense of community within ESOP because we could not meet face-to-face. -face. So one way that we try to address this is by working with our thematic groups and encouraging them to open up their sessions to everybody within the ESOP community or and beyond. Um, 
So that was one way. And the second way we tried to address this was to um, work with external organizations to organize events such as this, uh, so that uh, you know, we, there were more opportunities where our members could come together. So that is the basis on which ESOP Executive Committee took a decision to join the Regions in Recovery Festival and to when network jointly with the Re Regional Studies Association. Um, so besides jo joining this festival, we have also uh, numerous other events scheduled as part of our thematic group um, schedules and other working with other organizations as well. So in fact, we have ended up with one, more than with one, at least one event every single month of this year where ESOP can come together. And in some months, most months, in fact, there's more than more than one event, just two or three and even four events in some months. So just to say the event today is supported by ESOP and RSA. And I'm very, very thankful to ESOP thematic group in new technologies and planning which is led by Mikhail Campana and Paulo Silva for responding to this ESOP call for sessions and organizing this very important special session on new technologies in planning for addressing global challenges in emergency context. Welcome, I won't take up much time, so just say welcome to all the speakers and all the participants. Hope to see you at all other ESOP events as well, especially the 2022 Annual Congress in Estonia and enjoy the deliberations. Thank you. Thank you very much, Angelique. And uh, so now we are entering into the core of the session. The first speaker today is Karl Steinitz, Emeritus Professor from Harvard University, Graduate School of Design, and also Honorary Professor at the uh, University College London, Center of Advanced uh, Spatial Analysis. Um, Karl has been I believe one of the main contributor in what we call nowadays geodesign in the last decade, the community interested in this uh, methodology approach to planning and design has been growing immensely. And Carl also is coordinating a network of over 250 universities around the world. And um, so Carl, I leave the floor to you. Thank you very much for being with us today. Very good. Okay, just hold on a second. Let me get myself settled. Move that over here. All right. I, I think that this is the problem. It's big. It's serious. It's definitely addressing global challenges for emergency contexts. And I think it's a design problem. Hold on a second. I need to. This is from a, a paper that came out about two weeks ago from the National Institutes of Health in the United States. This is global land use change between 1960 and 2020, which is exactly the year when I started teaching and right about now. And what you see is change, either singular or multiple, that is both natural processes and human processes. And it's not complete because it doesn't show change in the ocean or in the atmosphere. But this is basically part of the problem. But our students now are gonna face a worse problem. On the upper left is climate-driven habitat niche difference. Red means that the people are gonna consider moving. On the upper right is fertility, which is dropping in parts of the world and radically increasing in parts of the world. And the lower left is water scarcity measured in months now. And in the lower right is the impact of three degrees Celsius change on estimated crop yields by 2050 where red is down 50% and green is potentially up 50%. The consequence of this, according to the uh, uh, National Academy of Sciences report from 2020 in America, is that about a billion and a half people, a billion and a half people will consider moving between now and 2070. 
and they're going to move from the red areas and want to move to the green areas. That's definitely analyzing global challenges in emergency contexts. The question is, how do you solve it? How do you deal with it? How do you even think about it? And it's my experience, at least, that what you have to do is think from global to local to global. You can't think top down and you can't think bottoms up. You have to think across size and scale. And there are differences and problems about that. The geographic sciences do very well at the global scale. And as it gets smaller, they do worse and worse. The design professions, planning, architecture, engineering, law, banking, all of them in design, they're offensive strategies. They're changing things. And they work very well at the local level. And they work less and less and less well at the bigger, bigger, bigger size, smaller scale, by the way, bigger size. The real issue and the way you can, you can hope to manage is if you can manage planning, which is a design profession, at major infrastructure to regional management. And it's this scale which is necessarily a collaboration between the geographic sciences and their defensive strategies, the design professions and their offensive strategies, the people of the place, and information technologists. And my, my presentations are normally color-coded by these colors. And we start with a fundamental set of problems. And that is, neither the scientists, nor the people of the place, nor the design professions speak the same language. And yet, and yet, the methodologies that have to be implied must involve collaboration and negotiation. Said another way, I don't think that the answer to the problems that the next generations are going to face is a data problem. And I don't think it's a technological problem. I think it's a human understanding problem. And the starting position is that we don't agree with each other. There are precedents. There are four important precedents for, for this kind of thinking. Now, I need to make an editorial comment. The, 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 the American and Canadian, the North American academic traditions and the European ones are really quite different. We, we really work from different literature. It's remarkable when you're in both of these communities and you, and you read the front parts of doctoral thesis, what's being cited. Well, I'm, I'm citing what influenced me when I started. One is Buckminster Fuller. The World Game, 1961, a comprehensive informational resource database, yes. Educational simulation tool, yes. Help create solutions to the open population and uneven distribution of global resources, yes. Herbert Simon, The Sciences of the Artificial, 1969. The natural sciences are concerned with how things are. That's really important. Even projection is important. Design, on the other hand, is concerned with how things ought to be. Secondly, everyone designs who devises courses of action aimed at changing existing situations into preferred ones. Norbert Wiener, in his book on cybernetics, collaboration requires two things, a framework for collaboration, in other words, a strategy for thinking about it, and a basis for communication. And that is shared knowledge, shared assumptions, and most importantly, a shared language. And his work influenced Herbert, uh, basically Marshall McLuhan, who talked about the medium. The media are the technologies that allow people to send messages to professionals and scientists and designers, lawyers, governments. They have to be able to talk to each other. And they have to then send a medium back to the people who make these decisions. And so this level of communication in a shared language among people who don't agree and who speak different professional languages is central, central to thinking about and solving global issues. And finally, Kevin Lynch, my mentor. I was his first doctoral student. 
from his book, A Theory of Good Ob Urban Form. And this is how you should think about it in his view. And I happen to agree. It should connect values of very general and long range importance to that form and to immediate practical actions about it. It should be able to deal with plural and conflicting interests and to speak for absent and future people. It should be appropriate to diverse cultures and to variations in the decision situation, the centralization of power, stability, homogeneity, the level of resources, the rate of change. It should be sufficiently simple, flexible, and divisible that it can be used in rapid, partial decisions with imperfect information by lay persons who are the direct users of the places in question. It should be able to evaluate the quality of state and process together as it varies over a moderate space of time, and by the way, and space. While at root, a way of evaluating settlement form, the concept should suggest new possibilities of form. In general, it should be a possible theory, not an iron law of development, but one that emphasizes the active purposes of participants and their capacity for learning. Those were important ideas. The generic problem as I see it is how do we organize and conduct not just study and research, but how do we organize and conduct the very beginning and strategic stages of designing for longer term change in a large multi-system, multi-client, relatively unpredictable and contentious context and one which should not become a zero sum game. And this is very frequently the situation for important and complex projects and studies. Geodesign changes geography by design, by purposeful action. Why geodesign and why negotiation? Because when fundamental conditions are changing, and they are, and big database models predict future problems, and they are, the end game of our work still requires a purposely designed spatial temporal strategy for future action. And this is necessarily a political process. Geodesign is serious. It is most useful at the beginning of thinking about and deciding on the strategy of what to do. It does not normally produce a precise final product, rather, the product is it could or should be something like this. Geodesign is dynamic. It combines system-based policies and projects. Geodesign must rapidly move from infinite possible designs toward a socially, environmentally, and economically feasible set of decisions. Geodesign is complex. There are multiple systems and geographic scopes and uncertainties. The geodesign methods should fit the context. Its technical support must be flexible, iterative, transparent, and rapid. Geodesign is collaborative. The natural language, the language in which it works, must be easily understood by all, and I mean by all. The geodesign endgame must support informed negotiation. The design will emerge. I've written about this for more than 30 years and done it a lot. And the book, A Framework for Geodesign, is basically questions. It's not answers. It's not a description of a methodology. It's a description of a workflow with questions that are inevitably being asked and guidance on how to find answers. The framework has six questions. Three of them deal with current state and past. Three of them deal with the future. Those are data, knowledge, and values. And there are three sets of questions in which the models associated with these questions have to pass. The why questions, where you understand what's going on. The how questions, where you decide how to work. And the what, where, and when questions, where you decide what to propose. They all have to have feedback. They all have to be able to change scale. And they all have to be making mistakes and knowing where you are. There is a workflow associated with, and it's a modeling workflow. I'm gonna demonstrate it through two projects. It has technical support. There are software programs which can support the work of geodesign, which is essentially using simple data 
and diagrams in very complicated ways by human people, not by artificial intelligence, and being able to interact with any other software of any complexity in any language. However, it shares conventions. It can be used in a commission, which is a normal way of professional practice, but it has two real problems. The first is at the very left, how do you get many people to agree on what might happen and what should happen? And a group of people, scientists, designers, information people, making a design through many, many meetings and presenting it. And sometimes it's accepted and sometimes it's not. And when it's not, it's because some of the people making the decision have other ideas that didn't get studied. An alternative, very common in Europe, is to have a competition. And the competition might be among collective designs, and it might be to take different sets of priorities. It could be a competition inside a large company. And the groups of people that are slightly different, or collaborating even, would be in different places, keeping their information private, proposing them, and a group of people who commissioned the study would say, that's the one we want. But they also can see then other ideas, and they may well want to choose other ideas and make their own or cause a new design to be made. And geodesign works in those ways, but it works better in open collaboration in which a group of people is brought in and they work on different ideas, but nothing is private. And they go through a stage of informal negotiation by taking ideas that they see and using them and then transferring into formal negotiations in which a design emerges. And the people who are making the decision and commissioning are part of the process in the ideal world. Why do this in a workshop format? And why do this in a workshop format even before you do a big data modeling study? Well, to explore strategic possibilities, to know what the questions really are, to identify the central issues, options, and choices, and to know what's really needed and wanted. This first study is commissioned by the uh, uh, Regional Commission of Sydney, Australia, and put together by Chris Pettit and his team at the University of New South Wales. It's basically looking at doubling the population of the oldest fully built out suburb of Sydney, Australia. Sydney's population is set to grow double by 2050. They need about 360,000 new people and 180,000 additional dwellings in this area, a new transport system and a new uh, uh, transport as a service system. They want to re reduce automobile usage, double the university and act for a larger and more international population. And this is the estimated floor area ratio needed in that zone. The participants were the actual people making the design decisions in the real world. Sydney Water, Arabs, the Pat Randwick City Council, the Botanic Bay City Council, the Land and Housing Corporation, the City Commission, Transport New South Wales, the Department of Planning, and several academics as associated with them. In other words, this is getting all the people who know each other but never work together in one room for two days, well prepared in advance. On day one, using the software called Geodesign Hub, which is a product of Rishi Balal, who was a doctoral student at uh, CASA at the University College London of Mike Batty and myself. Introducing the problem, showing them the evaluation models, the attractiveness models for different land uses, and showing them how to make a diagram either by importing it or by drawing it. These are all knowledgeable people. By 1 p.m., we're making diagrams that are color-coded of policies and projects. Projects are solid colors. Policies are dashed. These are objects. They have a cost. They have a time. They have a, a geography. And they have a time that it takes to do it. And by 1 o'clock, that same day, 
with different objective sets and different sets of assumptions, we had six different client groups, resilience, housing, university, efficient public services, tourism, and compactness. They made their first design. And by five o'clock, they made their fifth or fourth or third design because it's really fast to work this way. And they could design in time and they could design in 3D. And that's the first design and look how different they are. And by the afternoon, by sharing ideas, they started to get closer and closer together. And on day two, in the morning at nine o'clock, each team presented its design and in the upper right, Everybody's design in every way was assessed on everybody's computer and they could start thinking about how would we negotiate among ourselves. And we organized in the afternoon a negotiation between two sets of three teams whose designs were most similar to each other or symbiotic with each other. And it was literally a negotiation. I'll take your project for housing if you take mine for commerce, for example. And starting at 3.30, we had the final negotiation in public between the final two designs with special tools that enable live instantaneous updating of the design by sharing of projects or dropping projects or adding them, comparing system by system. And the last decision at five o'clock was where to locate the, the, one of the major new metro stations. And so at the end of two days, we had a design that was agreed to, a strategy for the year 2050. I need to move that. And we had it timed so that as the thing grew, its impact showed, its cost showed, and its projects showed. As the thing was developed, the whole timing and budgets started out with a major public investment followed by major private investments, which turned down as it got down to 2050. That was two days work. That's the final proposal of where the zoning should be changed, where the green infrastructure should be remade, where the blue infrastructure should be made, and where new urban, industrial, and commercial development should go in the area. And finally, what should not be changed. Roderick Simpson is the commissioner of the Greater Sydney Commission who caused this to happen. His last paragraph, the selection process and negotiation in the geodesign process could be considered a form of emergence, an idea that gains prominence. It is through the negotiation process and consensus where the geodesign process adds significant value. Now, how do we deal with this globally? In 2018, Tom Fisher, who's the former Dean at Minnesota, Brian Orland, who I've known in this kind of work for, for 40 years, and I decided we were gonna start a global collaboration. This was January, 2018. We now have 220 university-based teams in 58 countries with 130 completed geodesign studies. That's not including private companies of which there are about 200 studies done already. These are the issues that we're dealing with, but we're dealing with them globally and regionally, and now nationally. We researched innovations that could be expected by 2050. And we found about 150 of them. All of them are on the internet as PowerPoint slides, citation with citations. We agreed on the following things in the collaboration. We would study as many of these systems as possible, water, agriculture, green infrastructure, energy, transport, industry, commerce, institutions, and housing, and two of your local choice. That we would, we would study at specific scales, in specific color codes, with specific time frames, and with scenarios that dealt with innovation or non-innovation. And we would use the sustainability goals of the UN to assess the schemes either by model or by judgment. An example, the National Infrastructure Commission of the United Kingdom proposes to add a million and a half people between Cambridge and Oxford to an existing population of 3 million. 
They want to establish a train link, reestablish a train link. It went bankrupt previously and a new highway. It's a real project. It's by the way, a 600 billion pound project. This is a beautiful place. There's no demand for travel from Oxford to Cambridge, not really. The travel demand is local into London. It's a highly distributed area. There is no road. The railroad doesn't work. The high-speed train is not supposed to connect there. And there are lots of projects being proposed in the Greenbelt. In other words, this is a highly suspect government project. And the Center for Advanced Spatial Analysis, basically Mike Batty and I, we decided let's take this on as a project. So we organized it and we organized a group of about 20 of the consulting class, the people who are advising the local and national government and from the universities to a workshop off the record. This is an anonymous workshop of experts. There is no record of the people in it, except I know who they are. We prepared it using the national infrastructure assumptions about what they were thinking of and the variation of housing and Greenbelt policy. We prepared it for Geodesign Hub with very simple models. They're all in five groups, existing, inappropriate, capable, suitable, and feasible, immediately feasible. And we had cost data. We had innovation policies that were wanting to be dis discussed by these, con these consultants. On day one, we introduced the problem. We showed them what they would be doing two iterations and two time frames in one day, and then negotiating with a partner toward a recommendation. In the morning, we made diagrams and we made designs that day. We showed them exactly the same technology in exactly the same framework. They produced, sorry, they produced about a hundred diagrams in about an hour. These are knowledgeable people. They are each objects to be combined in a design. You can see the housing patterns that were editable and editing. By the end of the day, they had made five designs in at least three or four um, iterations, updating, updating the evaluation models all the time with their impact assessments. And the next day they presented them and they negotiated toward a final design. And these were the three sub-final designs. The left one is the existing policies, building garden cities, a train which can't serve them because of the first mile, last mile problem. And on the far right, changing the housing policies to favor high densities supported by transit and a big national park and converting some of that land up there to controlled agriculture because the climate will be like the Netherlands. Why not be in the same vegetable industry as the Netherlands? And the SDGs get much better as you go into these innovative policies. And then they finally negotiated a recommendation which has its demands, it has its project scaled, it has its budget. And that's, that's a much better plan, a much better plan but it takes action now to think about it for the next 20 years, 30 years. Now we've got lots of these projects in the first two or three years of a collaboration. They're all in the same language. Across the top are urban expansion. In the middle are river rec reclamation projects. On the bottom are coastal zone projects. We've got a lot of these projects and we've started to compare them. The first book is the comparison of the first 50 projects. And there was clear variance in what was important. What was important was conservation, water policy, and housing first, then agriculture, transport, and energy second. In other words, energy and transport don't drive the system. They respond to the system. Secondly, there was systematic variance by latitude, climate, macro geography, and general level of economic development. In other words, similar climate, geography, and economic level produces similar priorities and ideas. But focusing on one global system or proposing one set of global policies and projects will not be workable. Regional and local variation will dominate decision-making, but systematically. 
Michele and I have been teaching faculty these relatively simple human oriented and technologically supported methods for the past two or three years. We've been teaching teachers, university academics. And that's one reason why this group is beginning to grow very, very fast. And in my opinion, it's these human technologically supported studies that are gonna cause much more appropriate systems modeling studies and still be understood by the governor, the prime minister and the mayor and the people who vote. And without those last people understanding the work, nothing will be done that will work. I'm not sure anything will be done anyway, but without working in the way that the human people understand it, we sure as hell are in the, for a very major set of emergency contexts in the next generation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carl. I think you managed in one shot to answer both sides of our main question. So considering uh, planning and design as a process, but also uh, as a verb, as you say, and as a noun. Yeah. So in terms of uh, the process- We're treating, we're treating it as a verb. We're treating it as a verb. Yeah. Yeah, but also the, the international job yeah. collaboration, I believe, show also a possible way to introduce technology in, into the yeah. design. Right. Right. So, thank you very much. We don't have a, a question from the audience at the moment, so uh, I will give the floor to Professor Stan Gertman from Utrecht University. I'd like to thank Stan very much because I know that he's very busy these days also with uh, chairing the Coupon uh, Conference. Computer in urban planning, uh, urban management, and Stan is um, a leading expert uh, in, in the planning support system research. He edited uh, several uh, fantastic book, uh, monitoring cost and the evolution, and studying the impact of the application of planning support system. So, Stan, please. Okay, my my talk of today is about um, smarter planning. And the title of my, of my presentation is Smarter Planning for Sustainable Urban Futures. And I want to try to find some applications for research, practice, and education. Um, and I will get to geodesign later in this. Um, to start with planning support systems, and that is not a new concept. That's a concept that's uh, dating back already to somewhere in the 1960s of the previous millennium. Um, and it was in fact, uh, Britton Harris, the old professor at Penn State University who can be considered the founding father of this concept. He was asking already for these kind of support systems uh, in, in that period of time, while there were hardly any computers uh, going on at that moment in time. Um, I make use of a very broad definition, which I don't know who provided it, but it's, it's a composition, I think. Uh, and it's called uh, geo-information-based instruments consisting of data, information, theories, methods, tools, etc. And what's important in this is that it is dedicated, dedicated for support of specific planning tasks. And the purpose, at least the intended purpose of these kinds of systems is to cope with the uh, complexity of planning and policy making and to increase the quality of the planning and policy process and the product of it. Um, to give you some insight into, into this, into planning support systems, we made a categorization in informative, communicative, and analytic design-oriented ESS applications. And I would like to provide you with just a very brief uh, uh, amount of, of uh, examples of this. For me, an informative PSS application right at the moment is, for instance, a digital twin dashboard. And this is of the city of The Hague in the Netherlands, but cities everywhere in, in, in the world are building these kind of digital twin in 3D and even in 4D. And I heard some people already talking about 5D, but I have no clue what that means. Uh, so, but what, 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 is, what, what this is, is that it, it is, 3D, uh, uh, it's a 3D uh, digital uh, um, dashboard, which provides the possibility for visualization, but not just of data, but also of real time data. So of, of data that are at that moment in time valid. And it also can provide the possibilities for doing some analysis in this, like for instance, wind uh, um, simulations. 
A communicative PSS application, I've taken this from the University of New South Wales in Sydney, is for instance, map tables. Map tables are in fact just big uh, digital screens on which you can design, you can do some evaluations, you can do some adjustments over there. It is just an easy tool to work with. And what is nice about this, you can stand around it. And when you stand around it, you can, it can help you to communicate with the people who are standing around it. And that is nice of these kinds of tables. And then an example of an analytic PSS application is this one, Interactive Scenario Explorer, also taken from the University of New South Wales. Um, and that help can help you to, uh, to build uh, new scenarios and also to, to find out what are the implications of the different kinds of scenarios in that. These are just three briefly uh, introduced uh, uh, examples, that's all. This is my central, my central dia, in fact. You can, you, can, you can skip the rest of my presentation, but this is what I'm trying to tell you about. In my perspective, when you are trying to figure out what is smarter planning for sustainable urban futures, you have to start to look beyond the instrument. Um, and that sounds all quite obvious, but I see the, 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 all the different things everywhere else, more or less. And what I try to say is that I think we should make use of a kind of a conceptual framework. I called it planning support science, and I put it in, in, a, in, a, in a graph over here. And what I'm stating over there is in fact that to arrive at the smarter planning, what is needed is to align the technology development and application. So the instrumentation, which you find at the bottom right uh, corner of this uh, uh, figure, with both the specific field of application, which you find at the upper uh, corner, and the style of governance, so the process, which you find at the lower uh, corner at the left. And in that, you also have to take the contextual factors into account. Okay, to, to, to substantiate my, 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 my uh, this slide, what I will do, I will explain each of these components, elements out of this conceptual framework and try to convince you of that I'm right. And when I'm not right, then I will hear your argumentation. Okay, the application component you will find in the, in the top. For me, when we are talking about sustainable urban futures, I still think that we, have a, that you, that, that we still have a very big challenge that there is foremost a very one-sided foremost ecological notion of sustainability with very little guidelines of how to achieve progress into this so the question then is what are sustainable urban futures and how to achieve these um, okay to have some some notions on this so sustainable urban futures what are sustainable urban futures when you look at these pictures everyone will agree upon immediately that these are not sustainable urban futures, I think. I, I don't have to explain this, uh, I think. However, when you take this example, Pearl District in Portland, in the west of the United States, it's a very, very nice district with a lot of waters into it, with a lot of greens in the street, with, peak, with a lot of people that are bicycling, which is in my perception still quite un-American. We have quite some terraces where you can have a chat and a drink, et cetera, et cetera. In my perspective, this looks all very interesting and, and, and more or less quite sustainable. However, two years ago, I met someone who was living over here, Steve. And he told me he had to leave over here. Why? He couldn't afford to live over here anymore. The rents were skyrocketing. All the, the food that you had to buy was so expensive in this area because it was so attractive to a lot of people with a lot of money that, that everything skyrocketed in, in money. So from a social sustainability perspective, you can hardly say that this is, an, that this is a sustainable future. I would say. So what I would like to say on this, it's, it's hard to imagine what is then sustainable urban future. And the same can be found about and can be said about how to achieve sustainable urban futures. And of course, you can take a flow perspective in which you look at the inputs and the outputs, or you can look at the ecological footprint and you can make calculations on that, this. And we once had a workshop for a week with an interdisciplinary team 
uh, international in which we try to, 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 to come up with a metabolism perspective was very, very interesting on this. However, there is no one way how to achieve sustainable urban futures. There are a lot of different ways. And, and this question is still an open question for me. Um, we did a research project the past uh, four years, which is called Flood Label. And the, the purpose of the Flood Label project was to build a tool to increase the awareness of homeowners about flood risk and what they could do themselves to take different kinds of individual measures um, to, 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 to protect them, their homes uh, for flooding. And when you look at, at this project and when you look at the outcomes of the project, then you have to conclude that people differ very much in their perception of who is responsible for what. So you have governmental uh, organizations, people think that, that the government is, is, very much of, of, uh, is very much responsible or the water boards or maybe themselves or their neighbors are responsible for it. Concepts like social justice and fairness apparently play a role in this plurality of perceptions. And when you are building communication tools to become effective, what, what is needed over there is a dedication to this plurality of perceptions. Otherwise, these kind of tools will not work at all. That's about the application. Moreover, summary, try to summarize a bit of the implications. What I think is there's a need for much more balanced notion of urban sustainability in which the three components of social, economic, ecological are taking all the three into account and in which you connect them to the notion of speciality. And I think that someone like Lefebvre has, has put on quite some interesting thoughts on this. I think moreover, there is a need for attention for different ways, how to achieve sustainable urban futures. And I don't think there is one way. There will be different ways how to achieve it. And, and we have to think about this. However, in practice, when you are thinking about what, what this, does this mean, then I think that you have to bring the global challenges to the personal practice. And you have to connect concepts like social justice and fairness towards the in inherent plurality of perceptions and responsibilities. And what you need for this is a very much dedicated transfer of knowledge. And in other words, what you need is appropriate communication tools. That's one of the things that you will need over there. That's about the application uh, component. And I would like to continue on the governance uh, component. Uh, and in the governance component, I think that the challenges that planning has become far too procedural and too short-term oriented. Um, and then the question is how to overcome this. Now, when you, when you look at, at, at planning in Western Europe, for instance, it, it's very much process oriented. And that's not just for the last 10 years or so. No, that's, that's already for the past 50 years. And in fact, that came over from the United States, the rational decision-making model we adopted this model all the time and, and, we, and we became quite well in making use of this model. However, we forgot that before we took this model, there was also another kind of model, the so-called content orientation, um, in which designers were, were in fact practicing and working on, on, on the design. And what we try to do in a, in a publication with Thomas Hartmann and Peter Gritte is to connect the, con the, con the contact orientation and, to, and the process orientation to overcome each of, of each of its, its uh, shortcomings. And we call this the context orientation, uh, and which was also practiced in, in, in a study in Helsinki with interactive design sessions. Um, and I think it's an interesting idea. I don't say that this is the final solution, but I think it, it is a good step in the right direction. Um, and the same can be, can, can be said about how to overcome the former short-term orientation in planning. When I look at planning at the moment in Western Europe, it's, it's very much operational. It's very much short-term oriented. And what we need is, is much more a connection between short-term oriented planning with long-term oriented planning. And to, to, to get over there, what we need, I think, is we need a, 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 a connection between research and design. And I think that geodesign 
uh, as, as, as just uh, 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 proposed by, by, by Carl, but he did, he, he, he's, he's doing this already for a long, long time, um, is a good way out of this one-sided orientation, I think. Um, okay, we did a research project ourselves for the past four years too, um, with uh, Hoxiong de Young and Patrick Witte, uh, and it was called Smart Urban Governance. And as part of this research project, we, we try to get some more empirical evidence on, on, on this framework. Uh, what we did was we, 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 um, we asked the participants of the past five Kuppen conferences, and that were about 1300 uh, unique participants. And we, we, we had a questionnaire and we got back that questionnaire, 300 valid questionnaires, and we performed some expert interviews with some of them. And when you look at the outcomes of this, uh, what is the highest added value of ICT, uh, then you have to say that, that most of the people that are making use of ICT in planning are making use of analytical tools to tackle transportation and mobility issues. And what is uh, peculiar in this was that it is both in a centralized and also in an interactive kind of governance uh, process. So it is not just one-sided, uh, interactive kind of process. No, it is interactive and centralized. Uh, that was peculiar. We, we didn't expect it, uh, to be honest. Um, so when I tried to, to come into a summarization of the implications of the governance component, I would state that what we have to do is we have to overcome the old dualities in planning, the content orientation to the process orientation, the research versus the design. Moreover, I would like to say that there is no one size fits all governance style. When you look at the Netherlands at the moment, almost everything is a participatory planning style. I think that's ridiculous. I think it should be much, the governance style should be much better attuned to the issue at hand. So it is the issue at hand that makes what is then the best governance style that you can take, make use of, or what combination of governance styles you want to make use of. And I think that you have to look for, for new promising governance style, like actor network theory, for instance, or just city theory. They are providing also nice ideas about what you can do in a new governance style. Getting to the instrumentation, instrumentation component. And I think still there is a, is, a, is a big challenge going on over there. There are a lot of smart technologies, and but I think that the, the people more or less outside of our field, they, 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 they envision most of us as a, as a bit of, of that we are play, that, that, that we are just playing with, with these kinds of tools. And a colleague of mine, he calls it always toys for boys. Um, okay, uh, so I still think we have much better to, to argue why ICT, why planning support systems, why they can be of added value in the planning and policy process. That is still not well done, I think. Not by ourselves, even after a life, a long life uh, uh, journey in trying to convince people that it can be of help, it's still not there. Although more and more people are, are considering planning support systems as useful instruments uh, within a diversity of planning fields. Moreover, what you see is more integration of planning support systems, smart city, uh, big data analytics, etc. There's an increasing demand driven approach for these kind of PSS developments in contrast to a form of formal supply driven approach, approach. And I think there is a wide recognition of the importance of contextual factors. I will get to that later on. To summarize, the technology is no mean, is a means, it's no goal in itself. And in that you always have to start from the application in hand. And I think that the technology you should make use of in a selective way. Sometimes it's helpful, but sometimes it's superfluous. And in that you have to collaborate, collaborate with a diversity of partners, both in development and in the application of the technology. I get to the contextual factors. One of the last slides I have. Um, I think the challenge is to identify what are the contextual factors of relevance and what are their consequences? What, are, what, are, what is their impact? 
we did a research project for the past three years uh, with uh, people like uh, Susanne Thoma, Albert Meijer, Anke Michiels, etc. It's called Smart Governance in Practice. What we did was in an international study, we made comparison of smart city projects in Utrecht, Glasgow, in Curitiba, in Brazil. And we looked foremost to the political dimension of the context and, and try to figure out what is the consequence of this for the use made of the application of uh, ICT. Now, when you look at Utrecht, we have quite a decentralized state structure with a very open democratic position. Everyone has a say over there. That's good, I think. The goal over there is healthy urban living and they, and they try to achieve this by a lot of and diverse uh, uh, range of, 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 um, of uh, projects with a diverse range of small scale technologies. When you look at the outcomes of these technologies, then you have to conclude that there is a lot of small scale technology experiments. However, they are all discontinued. So they stopped after the project and they were all very much uncoupled from the governmental processes, which was really a problem. When we look at Glasgow, the smart city projects over there, over where they have a very strong centralized intergovernmental system, they, what you see over there, there are two very big and dominant projects, the Glasgow Operation Center and the Open City Dashboard. And so when you conclude on this, then you can say that there are four most large scale technological solutions besides some smaller projects. When you look at Curitiba in, in Brazil, where the political context is a federal political system, we have a strong position of the local major, there were two phases because in between there were elections. In the phase one, there was a left-wing major. And what you noticed, what we noticed over there were a lot of bottom-up governance and small-scale technologies. After the, the elections, there was a right-wing major. And what we got over there was a top-down governance with foremost business support technologies, foremost large-scale. I'm almost there. When you look at the summary of the implications, then you have to, say, to, to, to notice that there is a need of an identification of contextual factors and their impact, I think. Moreover, there's a need for much more empirical studies to see what the role and the influence is of contextual factors. We have just now looked at the political contextual factors, but you can also think of cultural collect, uh, contextual factors, for instance. And to arrive, I think, at the smarter planning, it's needed to align the technology development and application with both the specific field of application and the style of governance, taking the contextual factors into account. My last one, implications for research practice and education. In my perspective, for research, for research what is needed is to attune the knowledge development to situation at hand. So the mutual fine tuning of the components of application governance instrumentation, also to the specifics of the context. For practice, I think there's a need for much more and intense collaboration, what's sometimes called the, qu the quad quadruple helix model. It's a difficult con concept, of course. Therein, you have to accept the uncertainty in knowledge uh, provision and connect the short term to the long term uh, thinking so that you will be fle flexible for the future. But also for education, I think there's a need for a much more pronounced role of interdisciplinarity in study programs in which technology skills are connected to substantial and procedural knowledge. I think this is really needed for our students and for our next generation planners to, to become and to be able to work in an interdisciplinary way. Um, so that is my story. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Stan. Um, I think you, you, you highlight a very important issue. There is the connection between uh, the expertise of people like us, we are, which are, who are interested in applying the technology to improve the process and, and the real processes that are in a way affected by regulatory frameworks, um, bureaucracy. Sometimes it is 
it is not easy, not, not easy. And what this test in research and work, seems to work then when applied to practice um, uh, is not necessarily successful. And, um, and we have to cope with this and we have to learn to cope with this uh, for sure. Um, time is running. I don't see any question from the audience. So I um, welcome uh, Zorica Nerovic Budic, which uh, is luckily with us. He managed to come, but in the fear of uh, issues with connection, she prepared uh, already a presentation. So I will uh, play the presentation and then uh, so is any way with us to for the discussion uh, later on. So let me run. Good afternoon, everyone. It is my pleasure to join this session uh, with my presentation on infrastructure integration, uh, which is the key focus areas with respect to the new technologies in the context of emergency and uh, global challenges like uh, climate change and so on. I'm associated with University of Illinois in Chicago and University of College Dublin, and most of the research or um, relations that are mentioned um, are coming from these two institutions and colleagues and researchers that I collaborated with through them. Um, just in the context of urban planning, we're dealing with strategic or programmatic activities that are focused to guide and manage future and address various challenges. And these challenges are quite complex. Uh, urban and regional uh, phenomena are complex and they require uh, systems that are multidisciplinary applied uh, with data, but also integrated solutions. So that's where I uh, believe is the key with respect to both data and technologies. Um, planning has, has a long history of dealing with uh, and using technologies 50 plus years, starting from general computerization, modeling, decision support systems, and so on. Now we're moving, not now, but 20 years back plus, we're moving into a web-based technologies decision, um, um, like geodesign, which was mentioned um, today and in the keynote and also in the systems that allow access, wide access to information through network of uh, platforms uh, for uh, storing and managing data. And this is what I refer to infrastructure. And then the next step are the various technologies that allow uh, contribution of data from users. Uh, so non-institutional data to be um, shared and used and, and hopefully integrated with institutional data sets to allow better understanding of urban and regional phenomena and uh, also uh, better solutions. So we're dealing with crowdsourcing, volunteer geographic information sensors, uh, and various applications, direct applications for collection of data, but also collection through uh, existing social media. So all of these are helping uh, planning, analysis, visualization, communication, and most importantly, planning solutions. And planning solutions, uh, in my mind, have to be integrated uh, and based on synthesis and design, uh, whether it's a policy design or physical design, but uh, it involves multiple, multiple aspects and understanding of how these work together, how they connect. Uh, that also applies to data and technology, and that's where we're dealing with infrastructures rather than specific data sets that are uh, separate um, and assembled only for one particular project, but actually um, a seamless uh, availability of data from various sources. We're getting there, maybe not there fully yet, but uh, there's a lot of progress that I'd like to um, mention and give examples. In terms of integration, in terms of definition, it's the strengthening of the linkages between places, uh, organization, sector, uh, and policies. And it could be based on territory, policy, institution, but also uh, infrastructure uh, integration in terms of um, data and infrastructure. Uh, various um, um, literature and research has uh, try to deal with uh, what kind of integration. Uh, 
dimensions are there, uh, what are the perspectives within which these are applied and so on. So they deal with data policy, organization, sectors, territories, and so on. In terms of infrastructure, it's the uh, physical and organizational structures and facilities needed for the operation of society or enterprise. In this case, we're dealing with spatial data infrastructure, which are technologies, protocols, standards for sharing and accessing spatial data. And uh, SDIs um, have moved over time uh, from more data-driven to process-driven and now more into uh, user-driven, but also, as you will see toward the end of my presentation, also um, uh, integrated approach with modeling and other uh, policy mechanisms <laughs> that could be automated and allow for integration, integrated solutions. And one of, another, another thing that I'd like to mention before giving the examples is the uh, paradigm change uh, that has been happening over the past 10, uh, 15 years, I'd say now. Um, and that is uh, the movement of the change in roles between experts and amateurs in terms of data production and use. Um, the, the traditional or old uh, model was primarily uh, expert-based production and expert-based use of data, which you see on your left. And then where we're, we have moved already is the multi multiplicity of relationships, um, including data producers and users, um, exchanging data, users becoming producers, um, and producers becoming users of, of these user-generated data, and also much more interaction between experts and amateurs. So the, the terrain, the landscape is much more complex, but also much more exciting. Some of the examples I'd like to give is uh, from my own research, but also research that I entered uh, through my uh, colleagues um, in various venues or uh, research publications or meetings. So just a few, one uh, that um, developed uh, tools during a project that uh, was conducted from 2011 to 2016 in Dublin University College Dublin with 30 plus um, uh, collaborate project was called Tourists Transitioning Toward Urban Risk Sustainability. Tourists also means a journey in Gaelic, so it was a, a major journey and we developed as one part of the project, one um, task was to deal with the geospatial technologies or geospatial infrastructure. We developed um, technologies that deal with uh, resilience and urban capital and use different approaches. So in Dublin, we use crowdsourcing and web mapping to deal with underdeveloped websites uh, within the city. Uh, in Nottingham, we use geo. We use geo timeline to deal with community development from the social perspective and connectivity between community. And then in London, we use uh, Twitter geo or geo analytics to understand the communication of uh, green infrastructure reports and research and data and collaboration that might emerge from these Twitter-based communications. So a variety of possibilities here in generating new data and using them. Uh, re reusing Dublin was specifically developed um, to uh, help planners understand the views of various users and observers of underdeveloped sites uh, in the city of Dublin and then helping planners perhaps widen their horizons in terms of what could be developed in particular sites. The, the application has been continued and transferred to various cities within Ireland and I believe outside as well. And the PhD students who are working on it uh, have developed an app and continued uh, with uh, a non-for-profit organization. As part of tourists, we developed a variety of other projects, including Rotterdam uh, from partners that were on the project Rotterdam. Um, 
is a city, a major, if not the, the largest port in Europe, uh, and they developed a resilience application that would explain to the residents what are the costs and benefits of various actions that deal with climate change and the interventions within the port and the city. Uh, so it's an app that kind of um, educates the public uh, and helps uh, promote the actions. Uh, Ljubljana in Slovenia was dealing with uh, mobility, sustainable mobility, and other places had a different application. We had Sofia in Bulgaria and so on. Uh, a colleague from University College Dublin was leading a project um, on what is European project called iScape that dealt with sensing and collecting uh, information on air quality and helping integrate that uh, behavioral and sensing information into policy interventions. Um, that was uh, the iScape project that has been completed by now. Uh, colleagues from uh, Delft University we developed uh, an application that was about sensing with various perceptions the environment, which was the public spaces that people were using, using uh, conducting a survey of these perceptions, impressions uh, of the quality and experiences within the environment, and then uh, accumulating, uh, calculating the data and understanding a more um, uh, group understanding, uh, larger understanding of the quality of, of these spaces. It was primarily based on the iPhone and iPad applications, but it was uh, leading into the research on environmental perception, and it was uh, developed in the context of that research. Uh, the colleagues from University of Chicago were working with Argonne National Laboratory on uh, sensing and uh, developing uh, tools for sensing the environment in Chicago and trying to collect that data uh, into a kind of a more comprehensive um, environmental sensing um, protocol and data collection. So they called their project Air Array of Things. Um, it was a, a computational, in, computationally intensive task to uh, install the sensors, as you can see on that first uh, closest poll, in terms of um, air quality, traffic, various environmental uh, happenings around these sensors, and then try to integrate the data into uh, analysis of that environment. Uh, Street View has been an interesting um, application that has substantially aided uh, planners to understand urban environment, particularly those that are not easily accessible due to time constraints or resource or, resource or any other. And they were both used in practice and in research for uh, understanding the physical space, various aspects of the space, the use of pedestrian commercial areas, um, the understanding of the um, movement, um, traffic, and so on, various aspects of uh, the built environment in general and uh, communications with that, within that environment, comparison of, of environment observations over time, uh, different times in day and so on. So again, very interesting uh, potential for uh, research and practice um, used uh, extensively. Getting a little bit more to examples of infrastructure, I'd like to mention a project that we conducted um, also in Dublin. Uh, we developed a prototype of an infrastructure that was called SIPI, Spatially Integrated Policy Infrastructure, that complemented data and information with decision support and analysis tools on two specific policies or policy areas or sectors. One was spatial planning and the other was uh, flood management. And uh, through these tools, um, the policymakers as well as citizens, various uh, stakeholders were enabled, uh, enabled a process of 
understanding uh, the interaction between those fields and were uh, aided in uh, proposing solutions that could that would um, go beyond a narrow understanding and try to actually uh, accommodate understanding of the other area in the process. And we found that that was quite successful to have that tool that would promote integration and allow understanding. So this is an interface that we use to model flood processes to allow understanding of spatial implications and modeling spatial implications or uh, patterns to understand the flooding. And again, uh, allowing for uh, enhanced process and more effective uh, policy development. Uh, we evaluated and, and again uh, found that uh, the tool was uh, quite effective uh, compared to more generic uh, infrastructure that is called My Plan, which is a government, uh, spatially uh, uh, SDI, government-based SDI with various data sets, but no tools and no specific policy uh, guidance. And um, another example that uh, we developed in um, in the course of uh, research projects was the crowdsourcing as an aid, as an additional data source for dealing with emergency. In this case, in this particular case, it was earthquake um, and combining the crowdsources, simulated crowdsourced data with various other sources and seeing how that compared with uh, actual data sets. So it was quite complex um, data manipulation and comparison of the accuracy uh, of, of uh, estimates of damage uh, to people and property um, buildings and um, uh, depending on the data source and depending on the integration of crowdsource with other data sources like gener generic SDI, remote sensing, expert data, or uh, again, all in comparison with the actual data. Again, we did uh, a case study in Bam City in Iran, uh, did uh, quantitative evaluations and found some marginal um, help and marginal um, um, facilitation and uh, effectiveness of adding crowdsourced data, which is an immediate response, particularly if there's, again, immediate capability to uh, react based on that data process of emergency management. And the final trend I'd like to mention is are the dashboards. That seem to be the trend of the day. We propose this as an outcome of our tourist project we developed over 10 tools in different uh, places and we thought that different tools allow discovery of different aspects of city, um, of the challenges and the problematic uh, within the cities and regions. And these tools could be uh, possibly to combine to actually allow simultaneous and interactive understanding of the uh, urban issues, urban or uh, regional issues. And that's where these dashboards are um, uh, becoming more useful and becoming actually developed. Um, just recently, I, I uh, found a, a, a dashboard uh, a website where various uh, dashboards were developed and, and uh, collected. Uh, by uh, Maynooth University researchers with Rob Kitchen uh, leading various projects and also a group of uh, researchers and organizations behind it. Uh, again, I would highly recommend uh, reviewing those. But again, dashboards within Dublin, Cork and other places, a digital platform for understanding urban um, uh, phenomena and understanding urban issues. Um, are becoming more and more integrated and more accessible uh, in, a, in a specific way rather than generic uh, uh, data sets. So we, we have 
many, many new tools coming on board, many data sources, user-generated content, and many opportunities. Um, that all information is useful in its own way. Uh, there is variability in quality, but uh, the key is uh, sorting through these data sets and integrating with institutional data. We have behavioral data sensing understanding, experiencing an urban environment on the ground that is very, very important uh, to have and to use in the planning process. So uh, uh, there's much development to happen and try to integrate these, whether these are in dashboards or other uh, tools that can allow um, import and interaction between these data complementarity into uh, uh, within the tools to allow for policy planning and place making uh, the future. One plug I would like to make is the um, special issue of the Journal of Urban Planning and Development by the American Society of Civil Engineer Journal. It was a special collection that uh, I worked on with a number of colleagues from US and other countries, um, New Zealand, uh, China, and so on. Um, uh, very interesting uh, six articles uh, dealing with decision support, uh, Twitter, crowdsourcing and methodologies that could be used, uh, big data with WeChat in China, um, again a variety of interesting applications if you would like to check out that particular issue. I have uh, Google Street View, um, um, serious games prototype by Alan Kapoplin. Like so, again, quite uh, quite a collection that I'd like to recommend. Thank you very much. Uh, this is the completion of my presentation, and I will also uh, I'm looking forward to uh, further discussion and questions. Thank you. Thank you, Zorica. Also, very interesting uh, uh, presentation <clears throat> showing and highlighting the need for integration not only be, be among technologies but also among data sources. There's also a, a, a common research interest we share with Zorica since a long time, integrating official data but also with crowd-sourced data, which can be used to show. Um, social behaviors and other aspects that are not embedded in a traditional uh, database um, model. And uh, I think it, it is emerging um, strongly from all, all, the, all the presentation that uh, not only we have to adapt the methodology to each case study, to, uh, depending on the scale, but on the lo local context. So we need uh, to have this cooperation. This is very clearly stated in the science framework of cooperation between designers, scientists, and also IT people, and in order to fit the need for, for the um, local communities where, which we are serving. And all this should be done collaborating together. Um, I will give the floor now to Anna Clara Moura from Federal University of Minas Gerais, that also is a very experienced in geodesign and uh, she's presenting a huge project she uh, just completed recently and basically also in this case she will show how, how she adapted the, uh, the methodology and the international also guidelines from uh, international geodesign collaboration to the, the, the local culture and context of Brazil with a number of case studies that were conducting coordination please Anna Clara. Yes, I'll share my screen and you tell me if it's, it's okay. Can you see? It's coming. Very good. Okay. I believe I will not put the, the camera to avoid crashing the internet. So control if it's okay. I'm not hearing you. It's okay. Okay, so I'll go. So good morning for me and good afternoon for you. I'm Professor Ana Clara from Federal University of Minas Gerais, Brazil. And I'm going to talk about a case study that we developed this year, starting in February and developed during this pandemic period. 
Oh, it's not going down. Okay, yes, now it's good. It's part of IGC 2021 meeting. That is the International Geodesign Collaboration. And we followed the plan proposed by the committee that was based on the creation of scenarios to 2035 and 2050, acting as non-adopter, late adopter, and early adopter planner. And co-creating idea for eight systems proposed by them with the possibility to choose two others. We decided to add tourism and culture and to make carbon credit a system so that the participants were expected to propose areas specifically to carbon sequestration. We invited 14 universities to develop the experiment with us, working in 13 metropolitan regions from north to south of Brazil, in quite different biomes and landscape, from Atlantic forest to central savanna, to Amazonic forest, from big cities as Sao Paulo, to small cities as Macapá, from a city created in the end of the 80s, that's Palmas, to, see, to a city from the beginning of Brazil as Salvador. Our goal was to prove scalability of the process because we work on 13 regions, but they are in fact 74 in Brazil. Or the same process could be applied to other case studies, to other regions in, here in Brazil. We wanted defensible and reproducible criteria in order to make comparisons. And mainly, we wanted to prove the flexibility of the method and of the tools, as we have a continental country and adaptability is very important for us. We started defining the minimum of variables we wanted to each of the 10 systems and to search for the data in the official SDIs in Brazil. But all the data went to elaboration to be transformed into geospatial information. We produced to each metropolitan region a collection of 40 thematic maps, the same theme to all the projects. And we decided that our university, the Federal University of Minas Gerais, was going to produce all of them to prove scalability and to measure time. In the beginning, I took one month to prepare three projects. But at the end, I needed just five, five days to prepare a workshop because I optimized the process. If the SDIs in Brazil were open as web map access, I could prepare a workshop in just one day. I need five days because Brazilian SDIs allow just web feature access. So I have to do the download and the upload of the data. We have a Brazilian gel design web blazed platform called GIS Collab. We say GIS Collab, based on OGC standards, Open Geospatial Consortium, that is composed by four elements a geographic database, a gel server, in which we define the way we consume and we give access to data that can be web map service, web feature service, or a dynamic creation of data, web processing service. We also use a metadata catalog and a WebGIS platform that was optimized by us in scripts and programming. The same collection of around 30 maps were available in WebGIS to each project, but at any moment, the participants could add their own data directly. Consulting the collection of data, in the first day of the workshop, the participants do what we call reading enrichment. That is, they get information from the collection of maps and they give information registering alerts, suggestions, pointing vulnerabilities and potentialities, adding new data in the systems and so on. So it's called reading enrichment because they are enrichment by our data and we receive their data. This is the example of reading enrichment in Rio de Janeiro metropolitan region, using the colors according to the systems to register information about alerts, suggestions, and so on. So in days two, three, and four of the workshop, the participants co-create ideas, registering them using the colors and symbols proposed by the systems, according to the system. So here you are seeing the dialogues, they are proposing the ideas 
And then we have the talking about the ideas, commenting them, uh, agreeing, agreements, not agreements, conclusions, a collection of uh, kind of a brainstorm about the ideas. And then in the third day, we do the votings. We also programmed a dynamic layer based on web processes service in which the results, the results are presented in widgets that are boxes. In this study, we prepared a widget to measure the areas proposed for carbon credit in square kilometers to calculate the percentage of increasement because we established a goal of 30% of increasement to inform the number of trees that were going to be in the new areas according to the biome and to inform the proposed carbon sequestration above and below ground. And just this week, just the week, this week, we prepared this new weed get. After we had already finished all the workshops, we planned this week, this new weed get that we're going to use in the next workshop. There is a new dynamic layer that we will inform about the number of ideas proposed to each sustainable development goal. In the horizontal, horizontal, horizontal axis, we have the list of the 17 SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. And in the vertical axis, we have the number of ideas and proposals to each of them. So this is a, a way to alert people about their performance during the workshop. So it's going to be used in the next workshop because it was ready just this week. The script about carbon credit was constructed from two global maps, the Crowther Nature Biome Map and the Global Above Ground and Below Ground Biomass Carbon Density Map. The first one from Crowther and colleagues and the second one from, from SPO and colleagues. We take the global map and intercept with the area of robust vegetation to arrive to the number of trees according to local biome. So that we have a table with trees per square kilometers and biomass of carbon above and below ground, ground per square kilometers. Using these indexes, when a participant draws a polygon, the system calculates the area and presents the numbers. In some cases, as in Belo Horizonte case study, as we have two types of biomes, the calculations are according to each biome. To give support to the drawings of the polygons, to the ideas about where to conserve, to add, or to replace vegetation areas, we presented to the participants a collection of maps composed by surface temperature, robust vegetation, and landscape ecology metrics. We decided to work with area core a stepping stones that's connectivity and shape factor. So using these maps, they draw their ideas and drawing their ideas, they have this analysis of the performance of the percentage of increasement of carbon credit in the area. These are the steps of the workshop. In the first day, we do the reading enrichment for the year of 2020 situation. In the second day, we constructed ideas for non adopter scenario. In the third day, ideas to late adopter scenario. And in the fourth and last day of the workshop, the early adopter scenario. IGC group also proposed us to analyze the scenarios created according to the sustainable development goals. We observed that the classification, this classification is very subjective. But when we compare the performances of all the metropolitan regions, we recognize that all of them improved the contribution from non-adopter to early adopter scenario. All the groups used the platform GIS Collab, the same collection of foreign maps presented by us. And we proposed the same steps to all the workshops. We registered videos with conceptual explanations and about how to use the tools. At least one of my students from the lab was a technical support during the meetings to each group. And when we compared the way each group worked in the same framework, 
they did it different. Each one had its own interpretation and appropriation of the process, what was very good, very good. The group from Belo Horizonte worked based on agreements and votings. The group from Sao Paulo worked as architects in projective designing. The group from Florianópolis, as most of them are not from jail studies, but they think as lawyers, sociologists, and so on, they decided to define ideas in tables, and after that, to choose the location for them. The group from Rio de Janeiro, as the professor is a programmer, they were very technological and used tools and medias to do volunteer geographic information. The group from Fortaleza, Ceará, divided the area according to landscape units to construct ideas based on that. The group from Campinas decided to divide the group according to the axis of sustainability, economic, environmental, and social. The group from Belém were from geoprocessing course, so they were particularly interested in production of data and maps. The group from Goiana took the opportunity to teach geography, physical and human geography as a teaching process. The group from Recife, Pernambuco, decided to test the possibility of developing a workshop totally in a synchronous mode. The group from Macapá, in the delta of Amazonic River, were composed by technicians from the state administration, and they worked as if they were in their departments, following the hierarchy and so on. The group from Palmas, the capital of Tocantins, took the experience to understand the territory as Palmas was created in the end of the 80s, in 1989, just around 30 years ago. And they really don't have a metropolitan composition area. They don't have a metropolitan region, but it's considered in according to the law a metropolitan region. So they decided to understand the place. The group from Carbonifera region in the extreme south of Santa Catarina had difficulties in applying the logic of innovation and change because they preferred to continue traditional. So they were instructed to propose another concept about change and innovation. And finally, in the case study of Salvador metropolitan region, as it was the last one, it was an opportunity to process adjustments. With the experience, we proved the possibility of scalability. We used the defensible and reproducible criteria. We observed the condition of flexibility in the method and in the platform, the GIS collab. And mainly, mainly, we prefer to analyze difference rather than similarities because we learn with them. Uh, this, this case study was published this week in sustainability. I believe it's, it's available. I received the, the link. I believe it's going to be spread this week or this month. And I must thank all the colleagues in Brazil that accepted to take part in the experiment during this pandemic period. That's not been easy for us here but it was a way to work together and to put our minds in productive work. And I must thank all of them. Uh, all the case studies are going to be presented in IGC meeting in one week. Each coordinator is going to present his experience and I'm going to talk this, about this comparison of the, the performances of the groups. So I thank you. Thank you very much, Ana Clara. Ah, you, you did an, an uh, immense amount, amount of work with, with this project. And I think the results are, um, are very rich and useful, both as a contribution to the International Job Design yes. Collaboration, but also um, exactly what you highlight in the, in the last part of your presentation is, is um, we have now a lot of data to understand how the technology can fit different purposes and it, it is how it is adopted. Mm -hmm. By, by different people. And uh, I'm very glad that there is already a paper uh, out, yes. but I'm sure <laughs> there's material to develop uh, many more, many more papers. So, so um, 
now I would like to ask everybody to switch on the camera and uh, we have uh, still some time. Thank you very much to all uh, to keep the time. We are, we are still 20 minutes. Uh, we are not uh, a very big number. This may be my fault. I didn't advertise enough, but um, I know that who are here are uh, people that are very interested in, in this uh, field of investigation. And I'm very happy we had the recording. I think this, this session will be a good resource also for the future for other people that maybe is busy in other session today or, or in other conferences is a quite busy time and with being virtual also this <laughs> does not help but i i'm, I'm very glad that we we have a, also a recording that may be useful to other people uh, in the future so i invite you um to have a, if, if there is a, a any urgent question to ask or any comment Otherwise, I would give uh, maybe another round of comments uh, to the speaker. Uh, Paolo, also, if you want to give uh, general comments uh, after all the presentations. I see two hands. I think the first one uh, was Zoritza and then Tiana. Thank you, Michele. I just wanted uh, to first thank you for putting together my audio with the video and uh, I did make it to the session and any audio issues were at my end at the original recording. So thank you for that. I just wanted to emphasize some of the key points uh, that would overlap from the other speakers that would overlap with mine. And one was uh, starting with Carl uh, about the purpose of technologies and tools. Uh, web-based or otherwise for uh, primarily for understanding, mutual understanding of various uh, stakeholders and their purposes and goals and communication. So I would, I found similar um, uh, reason for uh, technologies and tools that we're using in some of my uh, examples and applications. Uh, what Stan mentioned about the context and I think Michaela, you also uh, reiterated, I think it's crucial. Uh, one of the papers in that journal of planning, develop, planning uh, uh, and development uh, special collection that I mentioned, uh, the case study from New Zealand and decision support system was emphasizing specifically the contextual information and how it um, affects the development of the TL tools and implementation of the tools. So the context is really the key. And then I just want to comment on Anna Clara's impressive study um, uh, that really shows us how important it is to develop data sets that could be adaptable and reusable. And then over um, that recycling of data sets, we can uh, improve the process in the next iteration, but at the same time adapt to the new context and new uh, project purposes. So I just wanted to thank everyone and um, reiterate or underline these uh, points that would overlap with mine um, that uh, were in that recording, but I couldn't emphasize them uh, post fact. So thank you all. Thank you very much. Zorisa, Tiana? Microphone, please. It's good to have you. Thank uh, you, Michael. Us today. Thank you for being with us. Thank you, thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm delighted to be here, really. It's, um, it's a lot to take away and process. I mean, I, I already know Carl's presentation and we are now in the process of applying geodesign in our planning education. We will do the, the similar thing in the next few years with planning support systems. Uh, and I'm just trying to, uh, um, with, the, with the background of my, my current mindset set and the frustration of planning in Serbia with the inability of um, uh, uh, having planning perceived as a, as a, a social construction tool for, for um, experiencing and analyzing different uh, futures. I, I'm thinking that, um, that we should, as a, as a, at least I'm, I'm working as a, as a professor, I think that academia needs to provide this intermediary level of technology that it's able to uh, to, to have the transdisciplinary and transsectoral uh, and transcolor, uh, um, uh, like, like to work like a platform 
uh, for understanding uh, and, and connection between the governance and the, and the citizens. And this is something that uh, I think it's, it's lacking. We are uh, um, mainly uh, business oriented when we pr produce a certain kind of technologies. And I think that is a mistake. And this is where academy with its resources and not such a, a, a dependence on, on profit uh, I think that we should be the ones who are uh, really looking to focus into this intermediary level of, of uh, uh, technologies for, for planning. And I very much appreciate, Anna Clara, I will be listening to your presentation in the International Geodesign Collaboration next week. I really look forward to it. I am, however, having my own political frustration from my own country. I think that things in Brazil are not very easy. Um, so um, I don't know if, if we have time now to deal with this, but I, I would really uh, like, uh, like to know more about how did you manage to get academics to call collaborate? Because I think that first we need to understand that we need to collaborate if we want uh, others to understand the importance of collaboration. So thank you. May I answer, Mika? Sure, please. Yes. In January, I talked to three colleagues from USP, that's the University of Sao Paulo, and from Florianópolis, that's the University in Santa Catarina, because they were participants of child sign uh, meetings in the previous years. So I talked to them and said, let's do something together. And let's select a territorial area so that I can use my data, you can use our data. And then we decided the metropolitan regions. And then I said, okay, give me one month so that I will analyze the data and the process. And then I studied the SDI in Brazil and I discovered that all of them don't allow the direct link that's the web map service because in my city, it is allowed. So in my city, if I want to do a workshop, I just have to connect my platform with the local SDI and work. But in Brazil, it's not, it's not like this. So I took one month to analyze and to optimize the process. Then we started to invite new people. Uh, I called uh, Rio de Janeiro and then I called Recife and then I called Belém, uh, one group per week. I was able to produce the data in one week and now let's call someone else, let's call someone else, let's call someone else. And all of them accepted to take part because we were giving the support. I, I called them and said, I'm, I'm producing the data, I'm organizing the platform, and one of my students will be with you. Do you accept? Can you put this in a meeting in your university, in your course? And most of them decided to put inside their courses because we are teaching in a very different way here. We are not teaching in the school uh, with people, in front of people. So it's more difficult to teach this, these days. So they accepted to put it as an academic experiment in their classes. And all of them accepted. I stopped with this collection of uh, groups because I had to stop. Because I, I'm, still, I'm still working with new groups that, uh, that made contact to, to do the same experiment in their places. So you must uh, offer support. If you offer support, if you offer the condition, people accept. Yeah, I agree. It's also important uh, possibly to find, at least for the first time, some people that can at least understand a, a part of it. And uh, then one case study, one successful uh, experience after the other, then the word will spread and uh, possibly it will spread fast. This is what happened in my experience. The first time I had that, I, I work a, a lot with Carl and I learned the methodology and tested first with my student, with other researcher. And then um, it happens uh, by chance to meet um, some people, technical staff in a local municipality, group of municipality that understood, we just made a presentation, they understood the potential of the methodology and uh, they wanted uh, to test. We did it. It was success, successful. And then just, just the next one was a bigger one, again, with uh, 17 municipality. Uh, and uh, this was last few months during pandemic. So we did it fully digital, something that uh, Carl 
and I tested last year extensively, uh, but again in academic environment, but it, it was done and, uh, and it was very success, successful. And um, yeah, it, it worked very well. And uh, every time we are learning, since I started working with Carlo almost 10 years ago now, uh, every every time, I, and I learned this from Carl uh, as, as well as many other things. Every time we're under a workshop, you learn something more and you test something more, and then your experience, experience grow. And this way is always, in a way, easier to find more people. Carl, and you want the to first know? workshop was mine. That was the first one. Yeah. Was the was the worst, and the best was the last one that was from Salvador. I thought the first one was very good. It got all these crazy people together who hated each other. That was the accomplishment. The rest of the things that didn't matter. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the very first. <laughs> let, let me let me make let me make a few a, a few comments because I know that I must leave at five o'clock. First of all, I really enjoyed listening to Stan. We're in a sense of the same generation coming from different. I mean, his mentor, Britton Harris. I know his work, but I discovered Britton Harris's work after I started mine. And my mentor was Kevin Lynch. That's, that's coming to the same perspective from two very different genealogies. And I, I respect that, I really do respect that. And we came, actually, my conclusion and Stan's conclusion of our talks were very, very similar. They really are if you listen to them again. Second comment. For the last 13 years, I've been a professor at the Center for Advanced Spatial Analysis at UCL, Mike Batty's operation, which he no longer runs, but he's very active. This is, these are 30 postdocs and PhD students, all of whom deal with big data. All of them. There are five or six people in their 70s. I'm in my 80s, who have enormous experience. And the people with the enormous experience know that if you're going to meet a mayor or a governor or a prime minister, and I've met all of these, you don't go with a regression analysis. You go with a map and a pen. Then you figure out what the regression analysis characteristics have to be. Because you're beginning to know what the problem might be. And so the idea, the idea that all these postdocs are working, what what they're doing is they're building big data models to keep exactly the things that created the data going into the future. But if the conditions are going to change, the big data models are useless because the fundamental characteristics will change. So they're really good for short-term management. They're really important for that. But the further out you look and the more speculative you look, the less important they are. And the fundamentals are going to be more important. And here's my last comment. What I see in the research group that I'm with at CASA is a focus on real short-term needs, real ones, public health. The movement of goods and services. Flooding. Those are real immediate problems. but. But when we looked at the long-term 50, 2050 work from the first 50 projects in the collaboration, what we found was new issues were going to rise as being more important. One, the destruction of conservation as an idea. Two, water. Three, housing. Wars are going to be fought about food, water, conservation, and housing. They're not going to be fought about transportation. And they're going to be fought because a billion and a half people are going to be in places where they're not able to live anymore because they're not rich enough to desalinate water and pipe it from the ocean. Those are the problems. And if you really think, if you really think, that today's big data models are going to be valid in 2050, you're wrong. You're absolutely wrong. And if you don't teach today's students to think to 2050 and work backwards to tomorrow morning, you're also wrong academically. 
So the better problem is to let the students speculate and then analyze, rather than analyze and not speculate. That's my opinion. After teaching big projects for a long, long time, the students of mine who are doing important things with the best ones at not analyzing, but thinking ahead and finding people to do the analysis. I can name them. They run companies and they are the people who the governor hires to figure out what the governor should do. There are not that many of them, but those are the people who are really the people we're missing globally. We're missing those people globally. And they don't need big data to do that. They don't want big data to do that. They just want time to think. And they're not stupid. They're really smart people. So I actually think, I actually think the problem is in the universities as much as in the governments. And I really think that that's why, that's why we, we created the collaboration and it's open, it's free to be, to be part of it. You don't gain anything other than some tools at no cost, but, but, but the idea that Anna Clara can put together 12 schools or that Ljubljana University can have a national study, a regional study and local studies in the same language, those are real changes in the academic schools. And that's what's needed. We really need to rethink the, the, teaching, the teaching structure of why we're teaching. And by the way, especially of our advanced students. It's very important. I, asked, I sat down with, with Kung Jan Yu, who's my former student, who's the Dean of Peking. He's the most, one of the most important landscape planners in the world. And we each said, Independently, we need 10,000 people in the next five to 10 years who can do a big project complexly and fast and do it in a public environment where people understand. And all we're doing now in most schools is producing specialists. The wrong thing. It's just the wrong thing. Thank you, Carl. And so, Sam, please. <clears throat> Yes, I don't know if, if Carl was pointing to me in his last part of his words. Oh, I, I agree. I don't with think you. so, because I, I think that we are so close. Uh, I agree. I agree. Uh, so it, it's, I, I'm not looking for specialists. I, my last slide even, even went on to interdisciplinarity. I in, totally in education. agree. Uh, it's, it's really needed, I think. Uh, we, we, are, we are building too many specialists, uh, I think, uh, personally. So, um, and, and I always find it, it, it interesting to see, uh, Carl, how, how you are coming from a, from a different, let's say, yeah. Yeah, paradigm. Yeah. Uh, and, and I know Kevin Lynch, at least his work, I, can, I know it too. Um, and and what, when you, you put together your, your, your work and my work, I think that it's so close, to be honest, in, in I IDs. Um, and and it, it, it would be good when, when people take it up and, and, and use it and, and, and uh, continue on it uh, for, for practical problems that they are encountering. That is what is really needed, I think. Uh, I so agree. That's good. Uh, that was what I wanted to say. Diana, then Francesco. Um, Thank you all. I just have a, uh, have to go at, at six uh, sharp. I have a meeting with Jennifer Swift and okay. with Moitza Golubic. Okay. We will be um, having a panel discussion <laughs> on geodesign education. So I leave you. Thank you so much. I will be looking over us. this recording at least once more. And thank I you. Have to, and I have to go as well. And thank yeah. you all for coming. Thank you very much, Carl, for being with us. Thank you, Tiana. Same counts for me. Sorry. Um... Thank, thank you, you all for the session. Um, um, for you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you very much, all, for coming also. It was a very interesting session and a very you. fruitful contribution. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank yeah. you. I will stay just a few minutes uh, if uh, anyone wants to ask any question from the audience or any more comments. Thank you. thank you. Thank you, Zoritza. Thank you, Zoritza.
And Clara, very interesting. Your, uh, I'm sorry, it's a very impressive your project. It's really Thank amazing. You. Congratulations! I want to discuss this this platform in Europe. I had already talked to Michele about that, and with Francesco from Basilicata. And let's plan something in the close future. I think so. The, we could the platform do some... because it's automatically translated into your. We speak the same, the same yeah, language. language. <laughs> but to other countries, we can just change the language, and it's ready to be used. So and, and it's amazing it's how also, flexible how, it is, right? Yes. How flexible also, it is. Yes. It's not only about platform, but about method, the way we work. Because what I liked in the experience was that I proposed a way and they did different. And they arrived at the good, good, good answers and it was nice. That's it's quite great. Good. Yeah, it's good to embrace that, not, not to refuse yeah, that, that adaptation, like but, but to embrace it. And I think that that is beneficial for the entire process, I believe. Yes. I don't know. I, I don't know the process. Okay, I, I think flexibility is another keyword we need to always keep in mind because uh, um, what we study, what we propose, with what we invent uh, must be adaptable because uh, if we test two times in a sequence, condition will be different. And, and this is uh, also a major, uh, major issue. I think we are out of time now. I thank uh, all of you for being with us. I thank uh, also Alex and uh, all the um, organizers from uh, the Regional Science Association for hosting us. And um, I'm very glad again that we, we will be we will have this recording. I think it's a very uh, substantial contribution to the thematic group activity and the good memories uh, at this point of, uh, of time. And um, for the audience, I, I invite you to keep in touch with us through the eyes of the thematic group page. You will find our um, contacts. So if you want to have more information about the, our next activities, uh, just keep in touch, contact us, and uh, we will be glad to collaborate. And see you on our next meeting. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. I was very happy.